Hello and welcome to uh, Intel Swing Photonics. We want to talk about something different uh, in, in this presentation than the, the previous one. It's more about optical hardware, optical networking at, at scale uh, with uh, Silicon Photonics. My name is uh, Robert Loom. I'm a director, a senior director in the Silicon Photonics division here at Intel, and I'm joined by uh, Scott Shuby, who will present uh, a little little later as well in a few few slides. So let me let me start off with why we're here and why we care about uh, data center traffic and uh, why we need silicon photonics. It's it's really all about exponential growth in data. And so if we look back, and these these slides or these charts have been shown in, in various uh, forums, obviously. Um, so I probably don't need to dive into too much. But we've already seen this explosion in data center traffic over the past uh, several years, really over the past decade. Um, uh, it's about a 25% CAGR if we look at all data centers. But interestingly enough, if we look at the hyperscalers, it's actually closer to 40 to 50%. So you know, we'll, we'll talk about that a little later. Uh, the one thing I do want to point out in the in the chart on the left is really that uh, the you know the, the traffic is not just between data centers and the user or between data centers. There's the majority of traffic that we really care about is within the data centers between servers and switches. Um, um, obviously due to ma many different applications. So that's really the majority of the traffic that we care about is stays within the data center. And then, you know, the, the other point I think that, that is important to be, to be made is more on the right, that there's this massive amount of uh, digital data created worldwide that isn't even analyzed. It doesn't even make it to the data center. So there's this huge potential for additional data growth beyond what we have been, been seeing today. And so if we look at uh, the typical hyperscale data center, uh, you, you don't just have uh, one tier of switches, you have really multiple uh, tiers of switches. You have this claw or claws topology where we have these racks of servers that you see at the bottom. Uh, and um, you have a top of rack switch, you know, obviously at the top of that rack of racks of servers. Uh, but then we have additional leaf and spine switches that, that are already all today, all interconnected uh, optically essentially, right? So you have these uh, connections between the ethernet switches in the data center. Uh, and these connections can be anywhere from, from tens of meters to hundreds of meters. And they're all already uh, optical uh, today. So if you, you, if you, you know, walked into a hyperscale data center today and you look at what's being deployed, you will find uh, 100 gigabit uh, transceivers in, uh, in these switches that are typically fully populated. So you might have 3.2 terabit switches and you will find 32 of these 100 gig uh, transceivers uh, deployed in there. And um, what, 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 what's happening now is that obviously upgrading uh, today, we're seeing these upgrades happening to the next data rates. Again, we need to keep up with that exponential traffic growth. So we see now upgrades happening to 200 gig and 400 gig um, optical transceivers in these data centers. And optics is not just important because you need to connect various uh, services and switches. You also obviously have, that's shown at the, on the left, you have these pools of accelerators these can be uh, XPUs, uh, memory, uh, pools of memory, pools of storage, uh, various accelerator, AI machine learning, uh, learning workloads that you want to access uh, quickly with low latency. So again, you need a connectivity. And what we have heard from, from uh, many customers for years is that really the, the network is the bottleneck and that they have you know, stranded compute capacity in these racks of servers because they don't, they don't have the ability to get data in and out uh, fast enough. So having a high-speed optical uh, connectivity at scale is really a key, uh, key technology for, uh, for us and for the industry as a whole. If there are any questions, by the way, just feel free to jump in, you know, ask you know, as they come up. Uh, you know, I'm going to just keep going, but you know, please, please let me know if anything is not clear, it's because, especially because it's a little bit of a, of a different topic maybe for, for some of you. So if we look at uh, some of these, uh, the data traffic and we look at it over, over time, um, uh, it's obviously growing as you know. So this is showing all the uh, aggregate tra uh, traffics on the y-axis, you have billions of gigabits per second. And if you want the actual numbers, you know, please uh, you know, feel free to contact that uh, light counting company for, for the market research report. Um, but what is interesting is to, to see that you know, 100 gigabit uh, per second transceivers really started uh, uh, significant deployments uh, with you know, in the 2016 uh, timeframe. And so on the optic side and both on the optical and electrical side, these are actually four lanes of 25 gigabits per second. So you have four uh, electrical lanes coming in uh, to, to get the signal into the transceiver and you have actually four optical lanes getting the signal out. And I'm gonna talk about that a little more. 
what we're seeing now as uh, the transceivers are upgrading to 400 gig uh, on the optics side they're actually moving to 100 gigabits per second per lane so we'll have four lanes of 100 gig on the optics side that get us to 400 gigabit uh, transceivers on the electrical side actually we're still at, at 50 gig uh, lanes so we have increased uh, the the speed but we're not at 100 we're at 50. And then uh, in, a, in a few years, and that's uh, I'm going to talk about it. We've just started sampling 800 gig. Um, you will see uh, 100 gig lanes, but eight of those uh, for for 800 gig uh, transceivers. So you know, you know, large growth. And we also see that the majority of these transceivers in the in the data center is really uh, carrying uh, single mode fibers. So these are not your regular short reach um, active optical cables that that might go uh, tens of meters. These are really uh, single mode transceivers that can go hundreds of meters. And if you, you know, ever been in one of these large data centers, it's very clear that the distances you need to travel between these different uh, tiers of switches is really um, uh, hundreds of meters, so even even more. So real, real quick question on that. Are, Please, you, are yeah, you seeing, on the adoption side, are you seeing uh, uh, upgrades for cable plant as being a big motivator for, for the time frame for folks doing this? So what is interesting is that in terms of the the, the cable plant uh, that uh, that the data, especially the hyperscale data centers have put in place, they have already seen this trend uh, a long time ago, and so they actually back I would say back in the 2015-ish time frame or even before when they started deploying 40 gigabits per second uh, as the top data rate, they have actually deployed uh, they started deploying uh, single mode fiber infrastructure in, in in these hyperscale data centers. You know, because obviously the lifetime of that, that fiber infrastructure is much, much longer. These transceivers, they, they might get replaced every, let's say every five years or so, five to seven years uh, or, or even shorter. But the, um, but the, 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 the fiber uh, infrastructure really depreciates over much, much longer timeframes. And so uh, as, as sort of the, um, the data rates um, have been going up, the reach of multi-mode fibers has really been, been shrinking. And, and to anticipate that, uh, you know, basically all large hyperscalers have already installed uh, you know, single mode fiber infrastructure. And in fact, a lot of these um, optical uh, PMDs, these optical uh, multi-source agreements or standards, um, what they're trying to do is actually make sure that, uh, you know, the, the way the fiber infrastructure is used can, can be um, preserved and that it's, it's upgradable. So for example, when you have four fibers uh, to carry one signal, very often we'll see that they want to maintain those four fibers so that they can be seamlessly upgraded and that all that needs to change is the, the endpoints, uh, you know, the, the transmit and receive side on the transceivers, but you don't have to touch the fiber, even the fiber uh, routing itself. So what, what have we done uh, here with, uh, with Intel Photonics? Well, we, we kind of launched, or we basically launched our first uh, product back in 2016. And, uh, you know, we had uh, Microsoft on, on, on stage uh, uh, back then uh, talking about how they're planning uh, or how they're about to deploy uh, 100 gig uh, transceivers. This was uh, a, a, quite a simple transceiver, if you will. I'm gonna talk about that uh, later that had four fibers, four parallel single mode fibers to transmit the, the 100 gig signals. We have uh, the, then in the following years, we really expanded the portfolio. We still stayed at 100 gigabits per second, but we went to what's called a coarse wavelength division multiplexing uh, standard where you basically have four wavelengths and you multiplex them, you combine them onto a single fiber. And then you, you know, only have to, uh, you know, route one fiber and, and for, for your fiber plant, obviously you have uh, four times the capacity uh, that you can, can utilize. Um, and this has really been uh, the, uh, the majority of the volume that we have been deploying is really on these CWDM4 transceivers. Um, and then we have uh, RAMP, we have uh, released a transceiver for 5G wireless uh, infrastructure. So for wireless frontal applications for your cell tower, they're obviously all, uh, even for 4G LTE, they're all using uh, a single mode transceivers today at uh, 25, uh, at 10 gig, but they're now upgrading to 25 gig and 100 gig for some of these 5G deployments. And um, you know, I'm gonna have one slide talking about that. And then I mentioned where you know, we've moved to 200 gig and 400 gig, uh, that those started sampling over the last two years and they're now, now in production. And uh, what, what is interesting is that we now have this really scalable high volume platform for photonics, for optics. And we can use it not just for data centers, not just for networking, we can use it for all kinds of applications uh, where, where optics uh, is needed uh, at scale 
one of the first applications that uh, we've talked about also publicly now is for uh, for LIDAR. So this is for self-driving cars, it's light detection and ranging. And uh, I have uh, just a couple of slides at the end for, for those of you who are interested, just, just to show you one of the you know, possible applications where we can really leverage these decades of investment in, uh, in silicon photonics that we have done here. Okay, so um, what is what is kind of unique about uh, how we're doing uh, silicon photonics? Um, well, first off, it's it's obviously wafer scale semiconductor type manufacturing, and that's that's obviously uh, <laughs> inherent to to silicon photonics. We're trying to make optics at scale, but it's something that really is not, um, or at least hasn't been commonplace in the in the optics industry. A lot of these optical transceivers, and, and Scott will talk about that. Uh, in a little bit, a lot of these transceivers used to be assembled by by hand, and um, it, it's been something that actually you know, Google at the conference a few years ago they called it like uh, they called it a boutique industry, where uh, you have a lot of manual processes and it is not really scalable. And and as the demand for photonics for networking in general has really exploded in the hyperscale data center, there's really be, been this need uh, to have high volume uh, photonic solutions available. Right, so that that's one thing, and we're making these on 300 meter, uh, 300 millimeter wafers, and uh, um, we were able to test and burn them in at the wafer level. So we manufacture everything at at the wafer level and really minimize uh, uh, minimize um, any ma manual steps. We're integrating a lot of functions on the same chip, and what is kind of uh, unique for for what in our process is that we're able to integrate not just what's called passive components, not just waveguides and, and modulators in a way, but we're also able to integrate inium phosphide laser material, epitaxial material at the wafer level. So these are not lasers per se, but this is just the base material that is used to make lasers. And so we're able to deposit this inium phosphide uh, on the wafer, and then we, we pattern it, we, we manufacture the laser at the wafer level. And so what we then have is uh, we have um, uh, lasers as part of our wafer level process, and this can, and that includes also photodiodes that we can use in indium phosphide or actually semiconductor optical amplifier to amplify or boost the output of the light. We can make all of that at the wafer level. And because we make it at the wafer level, we can now uh, test it, as I mentioned, and we can also burn in those lasers, which is again part of a huge part of the cost uh, and, and of the assembly cost uh, if you have to do it with discrete lasers. So we're able to do all of that at the wafer level. And that's a big, big different, differentiator for us. So we have now, since we launched uh, four or five years ago, we have shipped more than 5 million of these 100 gig units. We're shipping about 2 million per year. Um, these two variants here, maybe just to uh, briefly summarize what, what these are on the, the PSM4 on the left, um, you have basically four, four lasers on the left, these uh, red hybrid lasers, and then you have four modulators. So for each of those lasers, you have a modulator and the electrical data comes in and you modulate the light uh, you basically, you know, convert it into on and off states um, uh, at 25 gigabits per second. And then you have four parallel fibers that transmit the light. And then on the receive side, you have the uh, same thing. You have four photo detectors that then convert the, the light into electrical signals. And you have uh, four fibers for transmit and four fibers for receive. And that gives you your 100 gigabit per second transceivers. On the right-hand side, and it does, there's a bit much bigger value proposition for uh, what we do here, is you have um, also still four lasers, but they're now different wavelengths. They are now 20 nanometers uh, apart in the wavelength spacing. So they're you know, 1271 all the way to 1331 nanometers. So all of this is in the infrared, obviously. Um, so we still modulate each of those lasers at 25 gigabits per second, but now we have an optical multiplexer. Uh, you can think of it as a, as a prism type of structure that's integrated onto the, um, the synchrotonic chip. And that combines those four different wavelengths onto a single output. And then we have a single fiber that can transmit uh, the, this 100 gigabit per second signal, right? And then again, you have a demultiplexer on the, on the receive side and you convert the light into electrical signal. So in a way it's transparent, right? It's electrical in, electrical out, but uh, in between you have all the conversion happening to, to, to the uh, to optics. And now you can go, instead of just going um, a, a couple of meters on the electrical side, and now you can go Two kilometers or even ten kilometers uh, with uh, with this type of approach. So, with these advancements in in optical technology, are they still doing things like uh, 
I, I noticed you have CWDM, but are, are these tunable, basically, as I guess is the root of my question, or are they fixed wavelength? Yes, so the standard here is it's it's, it's a fixed uh, it's a fixed wavelength uh, standard. So basically, there there's a grid defined, uh, and in fact, um, well, what um, what we can do is you, you can just operate it uncooled without a thermoelectric cooler over the extended temperature range, actually from minus forty to eighty five C, um, and so you just uh, you, you know the laser will drift essentially with with ambient temperature, but we don't need to control it or or, or tune it to to uh, keep it on, on, on the frequency. There are other approaches for uh, what's called a DWDM, dense wavelength division multiplexing. If you want to go not inside the data center, but you want to do, do telecommunication, metro type uh, networks. Um, these are operated at, at, at 1550 in the, in the 1550 band. Uh, and they have much tighter wavelength spacing where you do have to control the temperature of the lasers. Um, and um, and there, obviously, you need uh, tunable lasers to, uh, to to get it on the channel uh, on the ITU grid that 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 you're transmitting at any given time. So these are more complex modules, but uh, you know they're too uh, yeah too complex, too too costly for uh, inside the data uh, inside the data center applications. Okay, cool. Thank you. That second part answers my question a lot a lot better. That yeah. makes more sense. So they're not they're not DWDM tunable like a coherent optic, right? They're they're still a fixed wavelength. Exactly. So. This is not this is not coherent. This is what's called a direct detect uh, detection. But what is actually interesting is that uh, uh, for for some of the um, obviously for 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 so for DWDM you use coherent uh, technology, and and one of the reasons you use is uh, is that you get better signal to noise uh, ratio. But again, it comes at the complexity of needing. Uh, a second laser, essentially, or a local oscillator that you need to couple to that. So there's a lot more complexity in those those chips. And you know, we're obviously working on that technology. We have underlying building blocks for that, but you know, we we haven't announced any any products in that area. But uh, interestingly enough, for the for the lidar that I have one or two slides at the end, this is actually using coherent receivers for 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 these types of applications. Again, because you have higher signal to to noise ratio. But uh, for these applications, they're all they're direct detect. So let me stop here. Okay. So um, so yeah. So when you when you actually look, look at those modules, when you take take the lid off, uh, I, I keep keep joking that uh, what, what you see is mostly air because the photonic chip is really really small, right? These these modules have been designed for uh, discrete optics for uh, what's called a transmitter optical subassembly. A TOSA or for you know, corresponding receiver, a Rose, ROSA, that used to be hermetic, uh, and you had multiple lasers in there. We we're able to integrate all of that functionality on this this tiny tiny chip that's uh, that you see there. So we have four lasers, plus monitoring photodiodes. We have four modulators, uh, plus a lot of control circuitry actually, or monitor PDs that can um, that they can read out how much what the bias is on the modulators. Uh, they're all integrated on the on, on the chip, and then we have the optical multiplexer. So that's a that's a quite a small chip that just you have there, and then it's coupled to to a fiber. And the other thing that's very uh, interesting is that we're seeing really industry leading quality and reliability out of these components. And and part of it is inherent to the design, how, how the laser is manufactured, and, uh, and 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 the design of the lasers. And so we already see only only about two failures per 1 billion device hours on the lasers. And that's that's about an order to two better than what you typically see in the, or about two orders of magnitude better than what you typically see in the industry. And the entire module, we have a, a failure rate of around 30 dppm or below 30 actually for, for these 100 gate transceivers. So it's a really neat solution, high volume scalable. And um, and that's really, you know, been been quite, quite successful over the, um, over the years, and um, and again, the ability to make these uh, repeatably in high volume, deliver them is is a, is a big, uh, big, big, uh, big plus. Obviously, because again, it's it's once you have the design, you just run more wafers, and um, um, it enables you really to to get to volumes volume quickly and uh, respond to customer demand really quickly. And, and back to your point, I've got another question here about your point about the smaller chip size. Um, does that also mean reduced power and heat? Because uh, that's pretty, you know, pretty big deal right now with pluggables, right? Is trying to dissipate all that heat out of the actual transceiver. So 
Um, participation is becoming a, a big, a big constraint uh, overall in, in a lot of these designs, especially as you're going to higher data rates and as you're integrating uh, more and more components on a chip. Um, the um, the uh, the ability to integrate the the laser uh, on the silicon platform um, actually um, gives us a benefit that that um, we don't have those losses that you might have with coupling to the chip, right? So the lasers are already inherently part of the photonic chip. So there's some, uh, there are some power savings that, that we have because of the design. Um, but, you know, overall, I would say it's, 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 it's a little bit of a wash because again, uh, you, you know, there's, there's different types of approaches and uh, different types of trade-offs where power dissipation, at least for these transceivers, where power dissipation does become very critical and where we, we do have a significant advantage um, with these types of approaches is when you go to core package optics, when you integrate photonics with ethernet switches much more closely, that's really where uh, where the power dissipation benefits uh, of this technology start, start to really come into play. Okay, so with that, um, let me hand it over to, to Scott, who can talk a little more about uh, you know, some of that co packaging, but also you know maybe do some comparison to the uh, discrete optics. So talk a little bit more about the uh, silicon photonics optics technology and a little bit of how it uh, is different than traditional or discrete optics, especially when it comes time to build a module like the one that Robert just showed. Um, so traditional type of uh, or, or discrete optics, we sometimes call it for for reasons that I'll go into in a minute are what have traditionally been used in the optics industry. And while implementations vary, they look usually look something like on the left. So you have, this is 100 gigabit per second transmitter. So it's four by 25 gig, four optical streams um, combined onto four wavelengths combined onto a single fiber. So with the traditional type of approach, and this is similar to you know, other companies that Robert and I are both uh, optics industry, uh, have been in the optics industry for a while. We've both seen implementations like this that are shipping in the market now. This is a, a so-called gold box type approach. So the first thing is that it's a high-end hermetically sealed gold plated box. And inside are a number of different optical piece parts. So there's monitor photodiodes, to monitor the power going out, there's an optical multiplexer uh, to combine the different channels of light onto wavelengths of light onto a fiber. And the blown up view shown here, there's uh, modulators, lasers, lenses, I mean, a number of other parts that are not shown for simplicity. And so in a traditional type approach, all of these elements are separate discrete elements. So they're, um, they're, they're small chips, they're small assemblies. Um, and each of these parts has to be precision placed next to each other optically aligned with each other and to provide an optical path and then literally glued into place. So epoxied into place. And so, um, so that's, a, that's the traditional type of approach that's been used in the optics industry for, for many years. So the Intel silicon photonics type approach is a much more integrated approach as shown on the right. So for instance, in the same 100 gigabit per second optical transmitter, all of these different functions are there. So the four by 25 gig uh, uh, optical uh, transmitter, the, 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 the multiplexer, the monitor photodiodes, but those are all monolithically integrated onto a single CMOS die as shown here. And this blown up view at the bottom shows where those functions sit on the chip. So MUPs, modulators, uh, lasers, and monitor photodiodes. Um, and so this is the fundamental difference uh, when, it, when it comes to silicon photonics versus discrete optics or traditional type approaches. Um, and so integrating everything onto the chip, as, as, as Robert's talked about, gives certain advantages. When it comes time to build the modules, it you know, is much more repeatable, much more scalable. Um, and as Robert alluded to in the, in the reliability comment, a lot fewer um, manual assembly steps, epoxy joints, and potential points of failure. And so that's uh, that's really uh, what I wanted to highlight here. So I'll give another example of a of a next generation optical transceiver. Um, so so Robert was talking about the 100 gig CWM4, which is uh, has been shipping in volume for a few years now um, into hyperscale and other cloud customers, and it will continue to ship for for quite a while. But um, we're already starting to look at higher data rate parts. So one of these that we recently released to production uh, uh, last year is 400 gig DR4. So this one is, um, uh, is is four times the data rate, and it's uh, on the optical side. It's four by 100 gigs, so on parallel fiber. 
So you can see here on the right, there's parallel fibers, four fibers, and each fiber is carrying 100 gig of optical bandwidth. And for a combined aggregate throughput of 400 gig. Um, so this all goes out on a ribbon type or parallel fiber cable. Um, and then inside the module itself um, uh, is uh, you know, several elements. So, so first I'll talk about uh, starting from the left. So on the left is the electrical high-speed input. So this is where the module would plug into and interface with uh, networking equipment. So uh, the predominant use uh, going out of the gate for this is 12.8 is terabit Ethernet switches. So just like uh, Robert was talking about on a 3.2T, we would have 32 100 gig modules plugged into the switch. In this case, a 12.8T, you'd have 32 400 gig modules plugged into the switch. Um, so uh, it's 50 gig per lane electrically coming in on the left. Uh, and, and these are all, these interfaces are all dictated by, uh, by standards. So there's an IEEE standard interface on the left comes in to a uh, retimer or DSP chip, electrical chip. So all of these green boxes are electrical ICs. Um, then the signal travels through a high speed analog uh, modulator driver. So drive the photonics. And then these two gray boxes are the photonics chips. So on the transmit side, there's uh, this gray box has, has four lasers, uh, four modulators, uh, monitor photodiodes, waveguides, and a number of other, other features all monolithically integrated into a single silicon photonics chip, just like for the CWM4 um, for the 100 gig parts. And then on the receive side, it's it got an integrated uh, photodiode array to detect the light and then take it back electrically through the same pathway that, that, that it came in back to the networking equipment. Um, and so on the right, you can see what the what the module looks like, and it's, it's at least at a high level quite similar to our CWM4. Again, a lot of air, like uh, Robert was talking about, um, the the actual chips and the optical subassemblies are quite small relative to the size of the module. And the fibers just come out on the transmit side, that transmitter's at the top, and then the receiver's at the bottom um, uh, receiving the data from the other side of the link. All right, and then um, that's that's one example. So I'll show here, these are some types of silicon photonics transceivers that are uh, either in production now or um, going to be in production uh, by the end of this year. Um, so uh, the, and these are all standards based transceivers. So even though they have the silicon photonics technology inside, which, which gives, uh, gives certain advantages in terms of reliability and scalability, they are all standards based. So they're fully interoperable on both sides. So these, these will plug into the same um, 100 gig or 400 gig or 200 gig uh, optical module slots um, as, as, as other transceivers can. Um, uh, in a standardized way, and will interoperate on the optical side with other networking equipment or other or, or, or other modules using uh, using different technology approaches. Um, so on the top, there's 100 gigabit per second, um, 100 gig PSM4, CWM4, and these are all different reaches. So, for instance, PSM4 and CWM4 goes up to two kilometers. For short reach parts that go short, the SR4 and active optical cables go shorter reach. LR4 goes up to 10 kilometers. And, so, and, uh, and then at the bottom, there's higher data rate parts. So 400 gig DR4 that goes up to two kilometers, 200 gig FR4 for customers that want 200 gigabit worth, worth of bandwidth, and 400 gig FR4 uh, that, goes, that goes two kilometers, and LR4 that goes 10 kilometers. So these are all different flavors that depending on the customer need or the application uh, or the reach or the topology of the network um, or the fiber type that's deployed um, could make sense uh, for, for given application. So we're, we're, uh, these are all uh, things that silicon photonics can cover. Another question here, uh, you know, if, if you go back a slide, you talked about how DR4 um, is kind of a look into future or next gen um, optics. And I'm kind of curious, what's the, what's the value or what, what's the reason to go with DR4 over something like FR4, LR4? Um, I guess, is it uh, cost savings, power, heat savings? It just, it seems like, you know, going with the multiple fibers over just your regular two fibers would be less advantageous. Right. So in most cases, there's kind of two cases where we see customer interest for this. Um, so one is the case where it is a 400 gig connection, but there there's already so much fiber deployed because it's been deployed, you know, eight years ago or something like that, that it's kind of considered a sunk cost. And then it's just a straight up 
co transceiver cost comparison and the fiber is not taken into account. That would be one example. But the but the prime the prime example is that what DR4 gives you um, if, if a customer needs it that FR4 doesn't is the chance to do breakout. So um, you could do a 400 gig link, but you could also do a four by 100 gig link and have each of those 100 gigs go connect to a different uh, you know network element in like a mesh type configuration or or a, you know a breakout to 100 gigabit ethernet so we do see um, most of the customers that are asking for dr4 are, are planning on using it in that breakout mode okay um so i'll talk a little bit about beyond 400 gig um, so i showed on that the the prior roadmap slide um the the parts that are in production or, or are about to be in production, um, which goes up to 400 gigabits per second. But there's already work in the industry um, uh, on beyond 400 gig. And the next step is 800 gig. So, um, and when I say 800 gig, it may or may not be 800 gigabit ethernet as such. Um, in fact, most early deployments of this we're seeing are really two by 400 gigabit ethernet. So you can imagine two, two 400 gigabit ethernet interface, optical interfaces, but in the same package. So it kind of double density 400 gig. Um, so we see it in, in uh, there's, there's two types of main optical module form factors. There's the QSFP DD and OSFP, which are, are somewhat similar, but have, have different mechanical features and slightly different size. Um, they both can be used as, for instance, 32 up in, in an Ethernet switch, but um, but they um, you know, they're, they're, they have different thermal and, and other and other details associated with them, um, and um, you know beyond uh, e even beyond 800 gig, there's um, there's development on we've been working on developing even higher density pluggables or higher or higher density co-packaged optics, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, so silicon photonics is particularly suited for scaling up in channel count. So adding another channel is less costly um, to do with an integrated approach um, in terms of complexity, um, yield, and, and, and what have you than, than doing it with uh, adding another set of discrete components. So we've looked at, um, and, and in some cases demonstrated, 16 channels, 16 by 100 gig, and, and even 32 channel um, and, and, and beyond uh, type of, type of uh, higher density optics um, and then yeah like i mentioned these these initial 800 gig deployments are all two by four gig so it could be two by 400 gig dr4 sometimes called dr8 um, two by 400 gig fr4 um, and it's all the same types of interfaces so it, it can also interoperate if a customer has an installed base of let's say 400 gig fr4 from a prior deployment um, deploying two by 400 gig FR4 on another end of the link is completely interoperable um, with uh, with the with the installed 400 gig base. Um, there are efforts already to um, to start looking at uh, at four by 100 gig optics, and I'll talk about this a little bit on the on the electrical interface side. Um, so for 800 gigabit optics or two by 400 gigabit optics. Um, the electrical interfaces are expected to be 100 gig per lane. Um, so that that electrical side spec definition is in process in a couple of standards groups, the Optical Internetworking Forum and the IEEE. Um, and that would be to define electrical interfaces so that when you're going from a switch or router ASIC, um, that that interface either to a, either on a backplane and a chip-to-chip -chip connection, or in the case we're talking about here from the from the ASIC to um, to the inter input of a pluggable optical module, um, that spec definition is, is well along in those forums. Um, the OIF um, also kicked off a new effort to already look at uh, 200 gig per lane electrical interfaces. So that that's in the early phase, and and the spec may take a while to complete. But there's already significant industry early industry work and in, in looking at you know, channels and feasibility and modeling, um, both on the electrical side, but also on the optical device side um, to look at going to the next generation of 200 gig per lane optics, um, uh, even though the 800 gig is just in the, in the, uh, in the early stages of being developed and, uh, and is not yet really deployed. Um, um, and so there's a number of different groups looking at that as shown here. Okay, so now we'll talk about um, some of the challenges in scaling the uh, scaling the network bandwidth. Um, so we're running into 
a, a mismatch here in uh, in scaling of different network elements uh, bandwidth. So uh, the switch is kind of you could view as kind of the engine or the the core of the um, of, of the network here. So um, and the the switch uh, switch ASIC vendors have been doing a great job of doubling capacity, uh, doubling bandwidth every two years. So um, so as this blue line on the top. However, physics is not so kind. And so when you look at electrical lane speed, it's really hard to double that bandwidth. And so you can double the bandwidth by adding more, more lanes. You can double it by adding more, uh, by running each lane faster. It's, it's quite hard to do that. You need new materials, you need new modeling, you need new connectors, everything. So really the, the electrical lane speed has been on this yellow bottom curve here. And so um, as a result, you we're running into a, a, a situation where there's this this gap is widening and at some point it becomes not feasible to add more just add more lanes to a switch asic when you start talking about a thousand lane asics um, at 100 gig per per lane that's quite challenging as well and and you run into substrate size and other limitations and so um, this gap is is something that you know, the industry is is thinking hard about how to deal with so this is one of the things we're looking at from the optic, uh, optics as a potential way to help solve these uh, this bandwidth scaling challenge. So when you look at what's in high volume today in the industry, um, on the left, you've got uh, the, the state-of-the-art front pan, uh, panel pluggable optics that plug into the, the front plate of your, of your switch um, and, um, and run at up to 100 gigabit per second per lane. Um, uh, as, as, as the next emerging 800 gig optics. Um, and so this can be done with a number of different technologies, whether it's silicon photonics or other technologies. Um, and there's a number of different vendors that can, that can supply these and are supplying these. Um, as you go forward into the future, um, uh, and, and bandwidth scaling challenges become, become more difficult, you can start to look at something like co-packaged optics. So this is the idea that the optics are small enough that they can be integrated very closely to the switch core, in fact, inside the switch ASIC package itself. So instead of coming out of that switch ASIC package electrically, you're coming out optically. And the good part about coming out optically is once you get into the optical channel, you're effectively, you have much less bandwidth limitations and certainly bandwidth times reach limitations are, are, are very minimal compared to electrical. What Whereas driving uh, electrical traces at, let's say, two, you know, 100 gigabit per second per lane or 200 gigabit per second per lane all the way to the faceplate of a, of a switch is um, quite challenging, number one, signal integrity-wise, might require other retimer chips, et cetera. Or, uh, or if you can do it, it's quite power-hungry, uh, power right? And so if you can go come out optically, uh, there can be a lot of power savings here by limiting the length of that electrical trace that needs to be driven with, uh, with electrical uh, equalization and other power hungry methods. Okay. And then on the right, um, you can look at this type of approach, um, even coming to processor IO. And so this is something that, that we've, been, uh, we've been doing early development and looking at how can you really optimize uh, XPU optical uh, interfaces to use optics to the best advantage, whether it's in terms of reach, whether it's in terms of power, whether it's in terms of just uh, flat out bandwidth density for next generation, uh, you know, accelerators and other other um, higher bandwidth processor I/O needs. Um, this is a place where optics can play a can play a role as well. Um, that's a little bit further out, but co-packaged optics is being discussed in the industry right now, and that's what uh, we're going to talk about in the next couple of slides. So first, let me talk about one of the building blocks for co-packaged optics or for next generation higher density pluggable optics. Um, this is a test chip that, a silicon photonics test chip that we've successfully built and demonstrated. Um, and it has, a, it's, it's extremely high density, a number of different optical components on it. So I'll start with number one uh, is the, the lasers themselves. So this is a 16 by 100 gig chip, 1.6 terabits worth of, of optical bandwidth. Um, on this chip, there's actually 32 lasers. Um, so in this case, it's meant to demonstrate a concept around redundant lasers. So um, 
uh, for co-packaged optics, the one drawback is that um, uh, compared to pluggable optics is that pluggable optics, if if there's a failure um, on one of the pluggable optics, you can easily plug them out and service them from the faceplate. Co-packaged optics are embedded with the switch and so uh, as a result need to be that much more reliable. Um, so um, so th in this case, there's 32 lasers in the middle. There's actually two lasers per channel. There's a operational one and a backup one that can be switched to using the selector switches that are shown in number two. Um, so these can switch, you know, between the operating laser and the and the uh, redundant laser in the laser array. Yeah. Um, and then number three is the the modulators themselves. So these are an next generation, very small micro ring resonator modulators um, that are, are designed specifically for higher density um, and to work at 100 gigabit per second um, and beyond. Um, and then there's other elements that are not shown here. So monitor photo detectors um, and then on the right, the, the output coupling. So uh, this is a very highly dense optical chip. There's uh, uh, you know, it's over 600 active elements, there's you know, temperature monitors, et cetera. And this is kind of the core of some of the um, technology that we're developing for next generation higher density applications. With those, uh, with those selectable switches, um, what is the attenuation like on those? Because I know like in a long haul optical system, you know, that's one of the sources of attenuation is your, your WSS. Uh, on like a D D DWDM system, but I don't know, is that a concern in these co-packaged optics? Um, oh, so so for this type, for the job that they're doing, the we can make the loss quite small. So this in this case, it's like a tenth of a dB, so very, very small loss um, for, for this application. Okay, and um, so this uh, this uh, photonics is built into a co-packaged optical tile. Um, you can see here the 1.6 terabit optics in comparison with a currently shipping 100 gigabit per second optics. So it's smaller and much more bandwidth dense. So 40, 40 times the bandwidth density. And you can see here on the right um, a picture of the inside of the of the optical module using this. Uh, 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 using this photonics and, and highly dense packaging. So this one is designed to use to plug into an LGA socket um, and, uh, and, and usable for co-packaged optics. All right, and then, um, and then we took this to the next step. So we saw, so you saw the photonics, you saw the engine that it was, uh, that it was designed into or the photon photonics module. And then this was actually demonstrated in a fully operating ethernet switch. So, um, is something that we demonstrated back in in March of last year, um, uh, using a reference platform um, that our that our sister group uh, Barefoot Networks um, uh, uh, had developed uh, to demonstrate their their 12.8T switch ASIC. So um, with their help, we took that reference platform, 12.8T uh, reference platform, and upgraded it with uh, co-packaged optics. So that, that small engine that you saw there was actually packaged within the ASIC package itself. So underneath this silver retaining plate in the middle, um, there are four co-packaged optical engines. Everywhere you see two of these heat pipes come out, and there's a, there's a co-packaged uh, optical engine. And um, so the so again the the electrical trace is very very short between the ASIC and the uh, and the optical engine itself because it's actually in the same package. Um, so the and and then is those copper heat pipes go out to fin stacks on the sides that are um, that are that enable the the whole design to be air cooled just like just like you would for a pluggable optics design. Um, th those optical in this demonstration, half of the sites are are populated with co-packaged optics modules, and half of the other sites are are populated with flyover copper cables go to regular pluggable optics cages on the, on the front panel. So half of the bandwidth in this particular switch design is, is co-packaged and half is, uh, is pluggable modules. Um, and we demonstrated this running live Ethernet, 400 gigabit Ethernet traffic, interoperating with other commercial switches that we had in our lab, interoperating between co-packaged optics and, um, and DR4 optics. So it really kind of is intended as a way to show what can be done um, and work out some of the, the system design um, elements of, of integrating co-packaged optics for future switch designs. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Scott. I think I'll, uh, I'll take over now for sort of the last uh, few slides here. Uh, I, I promised I would talk about uh, LiDAR a little bit. 
So I wanted to, um, you know, to kind of touch base on, you know, how we can leverage all this this work and this technology that we have developed really for for other applications. And um, just to remind you, I mean, we we have all these components now developed, both active and passive components, right? So on the active side, we have the lasers, we have semiconductor optical amplifiers, we have uh, different types of photo detectors that can uh, detect the light. We have the modulators that uh, that we talked about, both the uh, Mahzender modulators that we used in the first generation and also the these ring modulators that we're using for the next generation. And then we have a whole bunch of components, uh, passive components, where we can combine light, where we can uh, filter out light. Uh, we didn't get to talk to all of those, those uh, different components where we can change or man manipulate the polarization of light. So a lot of these components, and then we can all integrate it and really make these large scale photonic integrated circuits on, uh, on chip. Right, and so one of one of the um, one of the uh, key enablers for some of these uh, higher output power uh, applications, uh, Chris, you had a question around uh, coherent optics. So obviously, for some of these long haul transmission, you, you you do want to have these amplifiers as well. But especially as you're going into free space, for example, uh, these semiconductor semiconductor optical amplifiers are, are really key. So basically, we have uh, light in the waveguide. We can pull it up. Uh, if you look at the bottom left uh, side view, for example, we have light uh, in the optical mode on the left coming in. We can pull it up uh, through a tapered design into the indium phosphide, where, which is an optical gain material. We amplify the light, then we can bring it back down into the uh, uh, silicon waveguide. And now we have much higher output power. And uh, if you uh, look at the chart on the right, it's a little bit uh, complicated, but maybe if you just focus on the red curve, because that's the nominal uh, operating conditions, we are plotting gain versus optical output power. So uh, maybe one, one point would be at a 20 dBm optical output power. So that's 100 milliwatt out, we get 10 dB of gain. So that means if I have uh, 10 milliwatts uh, in the in the waveguide, I'm able to get 100 milliwatts out of the waveguide You know, with my optical amplifier. But it gets actually even more interesting uh, at, at slightly lower output powers, for example, at 17 dBm. This is 50 milliwatt of output power. We have a gain of uh, about 25 dB, uh, dB. So basically less than a milliwatt of input power can get me 50 milliwatts of output power. So this is a really powerful tool for us. And we, we've talked about it in, in some of these uh, the papers that are referenced here. So really, it's a, it's a key building block for us. Um, and uh, earlier this year at, uh, at CES, uh, Mobileye, our, our, our partner company, uh, they uh, demonstrated uh, some of those results and they, they talked about uh, uh, how, uh, they're, how we're developing a LiDAR based on silicon photonics that really integrates this large amount of uh, active and passive components on, the, on a single chip. When we, when we count all the uh, little components on the optics side, there's actually more than 6,000 active and passive components on uh, this silicon photonics die, and you know, I'm gonna, again for those of you who are interested, uh, there is a link to some of those uh, press releases. So let me kind of summarize here, um, and really, you know, if, you, if I really step back, uh, we, have, we have developed silicon photonics over you know close to two decades. It started off in labs, really, it's, it's been a product for the last uh, four to five years, but now it's a really mature, high volume platform, right? We're shipping around two million of these hundred gig transceivers a year. We're ramping 200 gig and 400 gig now, 800 gig uh, is sampling uh, today. Again, it's all there to, to support the exponential growth uh, in data center traffic and really relieve some of the constraints uh, that we see in the data center, but also enable some of these new data center architecture, actual, data center architectures where you have much more disaggregated compute and storage where, where you have AI machine learning accelerators, XPUs, uh, right next to storage uh, and, and CPU for, for workloads. So really you wanna have this flexibility in your network uh, uh, and uh, the ability to have um, uh, longer reaches and, and a low latency uh, connectivity. And as I mentioned, we're making optics at scale uh, using semiconductor type uh, processing, 300, everything, everything is done on a 300 millimeter. Um, we didn't talk as much about timing for the core packaged optics. We really, but so I want to kind of summarize it here. We have we anticipate really initial volume deployments at 51.2 terabit uh, Ethernet switches, which is going to be around the end of uh, 23 uh, 2023 timeframe. Uh, we really see the the really broad market adoption happening at 100 terabit uh, switches. Once the electrical speeds actually go to 200 gig uh, I/O, there's 
really almost no way in our mind that uh, uh, core package optics uh, uh, will not happen. Pluggable optics, uh, uh, obviously, is very convenient. People like to use it uh, for as long as, as possible. But uh, really, at, at 51T, we already see significant benefits, around 30% power savings when you look at the system level. But certainly at 100 terabit, uh, it's really going to become uh, ubiquitous. And um, and you have some uh, some pictures here at the bottom from uh, from the demo that we did uh, last year and that, that Scott talked about. So 